Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good? Yeah? We've had an awesome church today. Um, third, first time we've ever done three services. You know, we did five last week, so technically we didn't do three. This is the first time we've ever done three, so uh, I'm glad you're hanging out with us today. They kept the lights on me a little bit. I didn't know what to do, right? Y'all supposed to be watching video, and then, you know, like, I'm up here being able to be seen. It's a little strange, because, um, you know, it was a, pastors always say different stuff, talk to each other about what they're doing, and I remember you know, some super spiritual guy, which I am not typically, and that may sound bad because I'm your pastor, but that's pretty bad. But anyway, um, <clears throat> I remember some guy going, I mean, I get on my knees back at the stage, and I just, I pray, and I, and I just, I just go to God. I was like, just, you know, whatever. And I was like, I don't, I, I just check my fly like a hundred times to make sure it's not down. And so uh, that's what I was going to do just a minute ago, but uh, <laughs> you were watching me, so I couldn't. So, <laughs> all right, we're good. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I'm glad you're here hanging out with us. I'm, I, I haven't done great on my times today. I, I was six minutes late the first service. I was eight minutes late the second service. Um, um, so, but you don't really matter because all you're doing is going to El Valarta after this is over with anyway, or however you, however you say that word. So um, um, anyway, uh, this is one of my favorite Sundays of the year, period. Um, so maybe like, well, I thought Easter was. No, no, this is a really important Sunday. Um, this, is the, this is a Sunday that we, a lot of churches don't pay a lot of attention to, but it's one of the best Sundays because God has worked in an amazing way through Easter and hearts are open and hearts are prepared. And some of you, you're here for your second time. Your first time was last week and, um, and, and this is your second time here and God's just kind of moving and working. And, and what we don't want to do as a, as a church and as a group of people is we don't want to um, do something awesome for, for Easter because you can do anything one day, right? I mean, come on now, you can do anything one time. You know, like you can get a, you know, that's what we looked at everybody was like, we're doing five service for Easter. I was like, yeah, you can do anything one day. Okay, so just calm down, and suck it up, and get it over with. But we don't want you to come back then to the next week and feel a letdown like what happened. You know, we want it to be consistent. That's why we get asked all the time, and this will offend some of you, but that's okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to light you up here in a few minutes anyway. Um, that, um, you know, some people ask us, why don't we do VBS during the summer? Well, we do do VBS. We do it 52 Sundays a year. Every single Sunday is Vacation Bible School at Union Church. Those kids uh, know they're coming into fun, fun, fun. And I want them to come to VBS and then come back to church and be like, what happened? This is horrible. You know, like, so uh, anyway, you know, it's, it's, the, it's important. This is a very important Sunday. I think that, that hearts are really prepared this particular Sunday. And, and um, we've already seen a couple of people saved at our first service this morning um, without an invitation. It's pretty amazing come down to the altar um, and you may be thinking where's the altar at well an altar is where God is so uh, here's one right here this is not a front of a stage and so anyway pretty amazing so I think it's one of the best days of the year um, I love I love this particular Sunday and we're always doing something different going into this Sunday like you know this is a great time of the year to launch into um, a third service and then ride that momentum wave that Dylan talked about at the beginning um, because this is I told our band this morning this is go time from now until Memorial Day it's go time you know, put the foot on the gas, press it down, let's roll. Um, and so we want to see as many people as possible connect to God and take those next steps. This is a good, good Sunday, so I'm glad you're here with us. Um, all right, let's, let's start off with a question. This is not going to matter to some of you. Some of you will be like, what am I talking about? But let's start off with this. What in the world is a hashtag? That's where we're going to start today. Uh, yeah, some of you are going to be like my mama. And that's why I said hashtag. She was like, ain't that a breakfast food? Don't you get that at Nicky's? Got meat in it and potato? No, mama, that's a hash. Um, not hashtag, but anyway, what in the world is a hashtag? Um, a hashtag is that is that little pound symbol right there with some words behind it. And some of you know when I said pound, you're like, oh yeah, you know that number on your phone that nobody do we even have them on phones anymore? You know that you used to use when 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 that when automated calling first became a thing, and you would make a call and you hated it because you would they would answer and you would go, 
uh, press one for such and such, right? And then it would be press pound to confirm your answer all the time, you know, and, and uh, all, all, those, all those things. And some of you don't know what a, that is. I mean, you know, you, your version of cell phones, like my daddy's version of a cell phone uh, is a phone that goes, or any phone is a phone that goes like this. You know, you know what I mean? Take you an hour and a half to dial 911, you know? Uh, and even back then it was even worse because it wasn't a 911. You had to actually know the number. You know, and so you just, people would be dying, like you're dying 12 times over by the time that thing comes back around. If I told my daddy to get a cell phone, he would go home, he would get that black phone out of the closet at their house. They still got it in case the power goes out, right, because the cordless phones don't work, you know what I'm talking about? And anyway, and it would be, he'd be carrying it around. <laughs> you know, this don't even work. Your daddy asked because it's not a cell phone. Anyway, um, hashtag. Uh, you use a hashtag to see what everyone else, depending on what social media platform you're on. And some of you are not social media people, and that's okay. I'm going to get you. Don't worry. Um, uh, you use it to see what everybody else is talking about about that common subject. So if you're on Twitter, you use the hashtag to see what people said on Twitter about stuff, and then the same thing on Facebook, and then they're different on all the platforms. And the Instagram, I ain't got one of them because you don't want to see pictures of me in my bathing suit. So that's just how it goes. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I'll give you a couple of, of examples. I got some hashtags for you. You can use them if you want to. Um, so, you know, cute dogs, you can see what cute dogs are, and then Struggle is Real, that's our series, use that. Now, I ain't saying that every hashtag you see is going to be because of us, and then the, the last one, you know, Adam Cook has great hair, you can use that one if you want to. That's a terrific one to use, it's true, I do have great hair. Somebody came to me last week after, um, after Easter, and, they, and I was down off the stage, and they were like, I thought you were bald, like big bald, you know, like, like shiny bald, and I, your head, and I said, no, my head's just really shiny, and there's not very much hair there. Um, and I don't know what it is about when you lose your hair, your head gets shiny. You know, like my wife has tried to like blot it. I'm like, it's not oily. It's just shiny skin. I guess this is, I'm an extra light up here for Dylan and the team. You know, they just shine it here and it shoots out and it's cool. Um, but yeah, you can use that. Adam does, Adam Cook has great hair. I do have great hair on my, on my back. Um, it's awesome. It's really good. Uh, so anyway, uh, and let me tell you, tell you something real quick about social media and those things. Um, and this is where we're going to go today because we're going to, we're going to talk about some very, a very felt need. This is the word we use, felt need message. After Easter, your hearts are open, and I think we need to be as practical as we can be and give you something that you can actually use and let God transform your life instead of just walking into church, getting confused, and walked out. So it's going to be very practical, and I think that it really needs to be preached today. And the reason that I'm preaching or teaching, I like the word teach better, is because uh, this is what God had to deal with me on several months ago. And I'm going to be real honest with you here in a little bit. But um, let's start with this. Discontentment and envy have never been bigger problems in the world than they are right now. Discontentment and envy have never been bigger problems in the world than they are right now. And social media has a lot to do with that. Because social media is a highlight reel of people's lives. You know what I mean? There's like, you know, most of you, that's what you do. You post your highlight reel, Right? All your good stuff, you know, all the great pictures of your kids, you know, and you don't post the pictures of your kids pooping their pants, but you post them, you know, when they, you know, you know what I mean? And, and, and there's, only, there's like three of you in the room, though, and we, we don't like you, we've unfriended you already. Um, but, you know, you're the only one that's posting, you know, I wish I had a girlfriend, nobody wants to date me, you know. And look, dude, every woman that's reading your post is saying, quit saying that, and they might date you, okay? Now, no woman want to date no man sitting around talking about, oh, I'm alone, right? Sh shut up. And so, um... Anyway, but most of us, though, most of us, we're not posting that. We're posting our highlight reel. And the problem is, is that, and this is where the discontent and envy comes in, is that um, we're comparing our other people's highlight reels with our behind the scenes. So we see what other people do and their great posts and their pictures and their families and everything looks wonderful. And then we know our behind the scenes. We don't know theirs. Like you see them pitching the posts of their car and they got this and they got that and they, got, they bought this. And, and you're like, man, I wish we had to do that. But you're not seeing the, the, the credit card bill they got they can't pay. Well, they shouldn't have bought it. But you see your behind the scenes. And see, discontentment and envy start to breed in that, you know. You start to see what other people are posting or talking about, or whatever, and you're comparing their highlight reel with your behind the scenes. You know, ain't nobody posting nothing but good stuff on Facebook for the most part, Twitter or whatever, right? It's, it's, their, it's their things that they're happy about, you know, the things they're excited about. The, 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 they're showing you their top 10, you know? They're showing you their 30 for 30 about their life. They're, they're, they're showing you, I'm giving you every sports analogy I can give you, but you know, they're showing you they're showing you their sports center, their highlight reel of what's going on in their life. You know, here's what's, here's what's crazy. Union Church is about four years old um, from, the, from the inception, from the moment we said, let's start a church. Um, four years old, and God, and, which is, blows my mind. 
because God's some, done some amazing stuff in a very small amount of time. Um, but I've seen this happen so many times just in our church alone where you'll see some folks online and they post constantly, I love him, he's the greatest husband ever, smoochy, smoochy, kissy, kiss, I love her, she's amazing, greatest wife ever, hashtag wonderful, great, you know, they're literally making love through social media, you know what I mean? Like, like get the room for that. And look, nine times out of ten, you got one and maybe that's not the case, but nine times out of ten, six months later, they're the ones separating, and get divorced, coming into church saying, you know, we're, our life's falling apart. Because you're seeing their highlight reel, you're not seeing their behind the scenes and Social media ends up kind of breeding that hate and that discontentment and that envy. So it's, it's kind of like this, you know, like mom number one hates mom number two because mom number two is a stay-at-home mom and she gets on Pinterest all the time and she saves her toilet paper roll holder things and they make cool crafts and, and they churn their own butter in the evenings. You know what I mean? <laughs> and mom number one hates mom number two because of that. But mom number two hates mom number one because she says, you've got a life and you've got a job. I wish I had a life. I wish I had a job. You know, um, it, all I do is pick boogers all day and this churning butter thing sucks, you know. <laughs> Butter's only three bucks, you know. And mom number one's hating mom number two because of that. My mama, my mama, um, I don't even think I told this in the second service. I think I did the first one. So <clears throat> um, my mom, she was here second service. I'm glad I didn't tell her because she was in here the last one. She got mad at me. But my mom... Um, She's always struggled or thinks she struggles with, right? Um, big thighs. You know what I mean? Right? And there's a lot of you ladies in here, you think you're struggling with big thighs. And you may kind of be because we can feel your thigh sitting beside us and it encroaches <laughs> over into our seat. Um, first off, let me just give you some advice. I know I'm digging a hole deep today. I've already done it. I, I talked about my wife shaving her toes earlier. It was bad. So, um, <laughs> and then somebody hashtagged it. <laughs> what the crap's wrong with them? Let me tell you something real quick. Let me, let me tell you something about men. Here's, here's what we want to tell you right now. Uh, you can focus on the belly. Sure. You can focus on the arm flap. Leave the thighs alone. Leave the hips alone. We're cool with them. All right? We're cool with them. I'm just telling you. Anyway, so my mom, though, she would, um, she would always be worried about that. And so she'd eat lean cuisines. Right back when they came out, you know what I'm talking about? They're still out now, I think. They're, the things are awful. But anyway, she'd eat lean cuisines and she ordered a thigh master and she'd be in the living room like this. Thigh mastering it up, you know? Just thigh mastering it up. And we go somewhere, we go out to eat, you know, and she's ordering a piece of broccoli and thinking about her thigh master. And then she sees some woman who's got it all together eating lobster and, you know, whatever she wants to eat. And discontentment, that envy breeds real quick when that's the case. And I know none of you can identify with this, so I'm just going to keep on preaching to myself, I guess. But look, let me tell you um, the more we compare ourselves with others, the less satisfied we are. The more we compare ourselves with others, the less satisfied we are. I couldn't pick a bigger subject for us to discuss on the week after Easter than something this felt and this, that is ruining people's lives constantly. The more we compare ourselves to others, the less satisfied we are with our own lives. Look, let's be honest today. Let's, let's cut through some crap real quick. I like that word. I'm going to say it a lot probably. But let's, let's cut through some stuff today. Let's be a church that's actually honest. Okay, can we do that? I mean, I think that, I think that the world could do, could ha would, would love so much to have a church that was actually honest. That's our biggest thing. Do you know that? That's our, uh, you know, we, Christ is what we're selling, and we're selling him with honesty. That's what we're doing. Um, I don't know if you know that, if you figured it out about a union, but that's who we are. Raw, unfiltered, honest. So you're not going to like it. It's going to make you uncomfortable, especially from your church background. You're going to get uncomfortable. Oh, well, you probably need to be uncomfortable in the first place. So let's just, let's just get a little more honest today um, and, and let's expose the discontentment we have in our hearts. So I'm going to throw up in just a minute the three main areas that I see as harboring the most discontentment in our lives and the most places that we're envious. And, um, and as I do that, I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to explain a little bit. I want you to raise your hand. I want you to be honest. Because if you're not honest in church, liar, liar, pants on fire, stick your tail on a telephone wire, okay? You will be in <laughs> trouble if that's not the case. But let's, let's go through them real quick. And I want you to, I, look, just be honest. Will you please be honest? 8.30 was real honest. 10 o'clock, bunch of liars in there, okay? <laughs> they need Christ. Um, so let's do it real quick. Um, here's, here's the first one. This is a big one. Um, most of you will want to say this, but you may not. Uh, material and financial discontentment. Let me talk about it a little bit before you raise your hand. Material and financial discontentment, that is 
you know, there are stuff that other people have and you want it and the stuff you got you don't like and you got a car and you don't like the car and somebody else gets a car. You like the car before somebody else got a car and then they got the car and you really want their car, right? Even though you forget, and I'm going to throw this in as just a little side note. I don't know if you know this or not, but if you have a car that does not work, follow me? Doesn't run, sits in the driveway. If you have a car that does not work, you're in the top 50% of the world. And if the car runs, you jump up another 25. 25% of the people in the entire world. Just 50% if it don't run. And how many of us have one that runs and one doesn't run? Lots, right? If you're from Caswell County like I am, it's sitting on blocks in your yard. Okay? You plant flowers around it and stuff like that. It's a yard ornament. You're going to get to it one day, but you're not, you know? But, you know, you, you're always discontent. And you're discontent about the money you make. You pay attention to what other money, 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 other money people make. You're always worried about this, and that's the thing. And you, it's constant in the, it's material and financial. How many of you would just admit, let's expose the discontentment we got. It's okay. Most everybody should raise their hand. Raise your hand if that's you. Thank you for not lying. Thank you. Oh, this is virtually the whole room. Let's go to the next one. Now, this one is tricky because you, will, you want to say it, but you won't because you're sitting beside somebody and it's going to cause a fight later. Um, the next one is, is relational discontentment. So it's not just material and financial discontentment, it's relational discontentment. In other words, it goes back to that dude that we said a minute ago who's constantly posting on Facebook that he don't have a girlfriend. Um, you look at other people and you see the person that they're dating and you're like, man, I really want to date somebody. And then you see this person and, and what their marriage and what their relationship looks like and you want that. And then, and then you're that girl who's, um, who's hit their 30s and your biological clock is blowing up, right? It ain't just ticking now. It's like tick, tick. I mean, it's just going. It's like a drum. It's like he jumped, you know, <laughs> Steve jumped up in your house and he's, he's talking your biological clock. And then you see somebody else with a baby and you're like, man, I just want a baby, you know. And then, and then some of you guys, you're sitting there going, I'm 35, I want a family, you know. And you see all this relational discontentment. And then there is, there's some women in here and where you would literally right now, you'd marry anything that walked up to you with a ring. And they ain't even got to have one, right? They just, right, they just walk. And you shouldn't, but you're anybody, you know, because you know, you're just ready for that next step. Relational discontentment. Or you're not happy about where your relationship is right now and you want to go somewhere else. Or your marriage has not been all that you wanted it to be or that kind of stuff. Or your marriage, you know, relational discontent. Will you raise your hand? A lot braver than the last service. All right, let's go to the last one. Circumstantial discontentment. Well, the first service didn't let me finish speaking before they said this one. Here's the only way I can sum it up. At this point in my life, I thought I would be Whatever it is. At this point in my life, I thought I'd be here. I thought I'd be, yeah, thank you for being honest. You know, that's such an easy way to just look at our circumstances and go. And, and, and I'm preaching to you out of truth today for what God's taught me. And Here's a, here's a verse that, we're going to get to John 21 in a minute, but I got a couple I'm going to throw at you. Um, but Paul, the Apostle Paul, he wrote the majority of your New Testament the Apostle Paul was, um, was the master of responding with Christ-likeness, responding as Jesus. He was the master at responding back through and seeing things through the lens of Jesus. And I want to show you something that he says. This is Philippians 4.12. You can turn in your Bible if you want to. Um, if not, you can look at it later. It'll be on the screens. But John 21 is where we're going to go, and you should open your Bible on that one. Um, Let's look at it. Philippians 4, 12. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. He's in jail when he says this. That's crazy. Because every letter I get from people in jail, and I get them all the time, basically is them crying, want me to come visit them, and want me to bring them a book. You know? And he's saying, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. Uh, he knows both. They, they just tell me that's not all of us. Like all of us in the room, I mean, you can pretend like you don't know what it is to be plentiful, but come on. Come on. I have learned the secret. Look, I underlined this word and italicized it for you. Okay, it's important. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. He's found the secret of being content with wherever he is, whatever he's got, whatever he don't got. See, I think a lot of us have found the secret to being content when we're plentiful. But we ain't found the secret to be content when we're not. 
when things are struggling, when we don't have what we need. And so I read this verse, you know, the first thing I thought was, I hope this is the first thing you thought. Well, what's the secret? Let's bottle that bad boy up and sell it. I could rock an infomercial, don't you think? Hey, we got this for sale. It's a secret to being content with whatever you got. I mean, you know, $39.99. Uh, well, we could probably go $99.99. Four equal payments of, you know, $56 a piece, $17 shipping and handling for something you download. You know what I mean? Like, anyway, I, I read this and I go, what's the secret? And you know what's crazy? You know the secret. Because you know what he's about to say. He's about to tell the secret. And you know it because some of you drank this, you drank a cup of coffee this morning with this stamped on the side of it. You just didn't realize what it came from and what it was talking to. Look at the next verse, verse 13, Philippians 4, 13. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I can do all this through Christ who strengthens me. That's most of us what we know, right? You know this verse, but do you know the, the predicate to it? Do you know the part that comes before it? The part that comes before it is, is here's the secret to being content, whether you got stuff or don't got stuff, no matter where you are. And it is, I can do this because I get strength from Jesus. The secret to being content with what we have and not breeding discontentment and not envious of our neighbors all the time is to do it through the strength that Christ gives us. Look, I want you to know that until Christ is all you have, you'll never recognize that he's all you need. Until he's all you have, you will never recognize you, he's all you need. And you know what? When he's all you need, then you will realize that he's all you want to. They go together. And see, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm sitting here praying for people to, to go through hard times. But I think some of you probably need um, to lose some things that you have to understand that Christ is all you need. And for those of you in the room that don't know who Jesus is, you never accepted Christ, you know, you're just here checking out. First of all, we're really glad you're here. Everything we do is for you. But, but secondly, that stuff, the things of this world, the cars and the cash and the women and the places and the men and the jobs and the degrees and all this stuff, they will not fill that hole in your heart that's Jesus-sized. They won't do it. Adam, how you know? Because I tried it too. And look, if you need to hear it from somebody that's not up here on the stage, lit up, you know, as you put me in some different category, ask anybody. It won't work. I tried it and I failed and Jesus is it. You know, until Christ is all you got, you will not recognize that he's all you need. He's it. He's all you need. See, some of us, maybe we just need to lose some stuff. You know, it's funny, the other day, I was talking about a guy, um, friend, you know, a family member, a friend of one of you, and uh, they were talking about inviting him to church, and he's one of those people that we would describe as it's going to take a miracle to get him, you know what I mean? Which, by the way, before you jump on your high horse, that's all of us. Okay, it took a miracle to get you to follow Jesus. Um, but he's one of them guys, and he's, and he's a, a typical uh, 38-year-old guy. By the way, that's what we program and push towards. Just to, I didn't say this the rest of the service. It's just so you know. Who we push to, who we program towards. What is the, what is the target audience? The 30-some-year-old man. Because if we can get him, we can get anybody. You get the 30-some man, you'll get, your, you'll get their wife and their kids. You'll get all of them. And we target and push towards it because they're hard. And they said, what is it going to take to get what is it? And I said, well, usually, tragedy. Usually when they get to that point, something bad's got to happen in their life for them to realize that they need Jesus. Because until you realize that he is all you need, you can't fill that hole with something else. And that discontentment's going to be there. You'll be discontent with what you got. Let me tell you something. You, if you want to find the power of contentment, of being content, everything else has got to be stripped away. And then you have to realize that he's our rock, that he's our sustainer, that he's our redeemer, that he's the peace that covers our mind, that he is the assurance, that he is everything we need, that he's the breath we breathe, the food we eat, the heart that beats in our chest, that he is the love that we've received and know how to give love because we got it from him in the first place. 
Like he's the healer of our wounds and pains and problems in this world. Like he is what gives us life. You know, Job said, some of you, you looked at your Bible, you're not familiar with Bible, you were like, hey, this is a book of Job in here, but it's the book of Job. Job said, he gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But he is all we need, and until you really get there, you can't overcome envy. And so what I want to do is I want to tell you today about to overcome envy, we have to have Christ's strength. And we're going to jump into, real quick, two things we must do, must do to overcome envy. And I, and I want you to know as we do this, I'm only giving you two, and I haven't done this whole number thing or Baptist preacher alliteration thing in a while. I've done one, two, threes in a while. It's been a couple months, you know. And so I want to give them to you, and I want to challenge you today to write them down. Look, there's a pen in front of you, in front of you, you probably don't use. Oh, stung, didn't it? Um, anyway, in your Bible. Okay, so, so I'm telling you right now, God celebrates our next steps to him. He stories like we do. We celebrate them. We got next step categories. You know, you get saved, you get baptized. You get, we got these little categories. And God just says any step towards me is a step that I celebrate. And so how happy would he be heard and writing down notes? is taking a step towards me. You know why he celebrates us taking steps towards him? Because we're taking a step closer to home. He just wants you home. Write in your Bible. I'm going to give you two of them. Write them down. Number one, <clears throat> kill them. Andy Stanley says there is no win in comparison. You cannot win comparing. We will kill comparisons. Let me tell you some stories. The first time that comparison really got me, I remember being about eight years old. And my best friend at the time, um, we were about eight, nine. He was a year older than me. He actually died when we were 18 right after we graduated high school from a drug overdose. Funny how it com comparisons will get you sometimes. And um, he was the son of a lawyer. I was and am the son of a tire builder. And, you know, hardworking daddy, hardworking mama. Mama still work. Ann's half raising her grandkids, you know what I mean? And um, I remember him talking one time about how many rooms his house had. You know, because he's a, you know what I mean? Like their rooms would go to bed tonight and make other rooms. Like rabbits. And I remember coming back home and looking at our house and going, well, we got a, we got a, we got, I started counting rooms, you know. I mean, I was counting every room. The closet, I counted that as a room. That's a bedroom. That little room underneath the steps everybody's got in their house, I counted that as a room. Well, we could fit somebody in there. That's a bedroom house. Mom was like, uh, no, we don't. Yeah, we do. See that door? Set? And, you know, and I ended up counting them all in closets, you know, or holes in the wall. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I even counted that little door where you would, you know what I mean? That was the first time comparison really got me. But I, 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 was, um, I wanted to give you a recent one, too. And so as I was praying, I was talking to God. Um, God told me what to tell you, and I said, God, I don't really want to say that. And he said, well, oh, don't, you know, I, um, no other pastor is going to admit this to you. And I don't really want to, but I feel God telling me to. So um, I have, you know, and recently compared churches. Start to compare what one looks like, how many people it's got, you know, this and that, and what they have, what they don't have, what we have, what they don't have, you know. And then, I mean, I've even taken it this far. I said this first service, and the staff didn't even know I was going to say it. I said, I've even compared our staff. Well, they got a better one of those than we got. You know, well, we pay them half the price, so it's still a good deal. But you know what I mean. We got a better one than they got. And that staff member was looking at me earlier today going, uh, is he talking about me? Yes, I was. You know, I compare those things and offerings. Ah, it's hard for me to admit this to you. Anytime you go to any kind of church conference or anything, you know, the first question you get asked is, what's your attendance? What's your attendance? How many are running? How many are running? How many are running? I'll run into people in the grocery store or something, and, and we'll get to talking about it. They don't come here. They don't know me, but then they find out about church, and then they say, when's your service times? And I say, well, we're going to three this week. And they go, three? Oh, wow. What you running? How many people you got? It just becomes this natural thing to where you fall into discontentment and envy and comparison. And we have to absolutely kill comparison. And the question I want to ask you today and what I kind of have been asking myself is, is why do we need the strength of Jesus to kill comparison? Like, why do we need the strength of Jesus to kill it? Why can't we just kill it ourselves? Why can't it just be something to go, nope, I'm going to be happy with what God gave me? Why can't, why do we need the strength? And I'm telling you right now, we're going to show you, it's in James 3, 14, that we have to have the strength of Jesus to kill comparison. You have to have his strength. Can't do it on your own. You're thinking, Adam, I don't really get it. Well, check this out. And look, before I read this, 
if anybody knew about comparison, it's James. I don't know if you know this or not, but James was the little brother of Jesus, right? He's the little brother of Jesus. Can you imagine being the little brother of Jesus, right? I mean, I, me and my brother can't stand each other right now. Hey, brother, if you're watching online, I can't stand you. You can't stand me. It's good. You know, when we love each other, we're brothers, but you know what I'm saying. Nobody laughed at that. Y'all got some family issues. I was, like, <laughs> I was just playing. Um, baby, can you imagine if your, if your brother was the sinless one? <laughs> Oh, he's the sinless one. You know, and he's always, every time they play superheroes, he actually flew around. You know, you know he did that. You know, he was like, whoopsie, ha, you know. I mean, you know, he all, you know, and can you imagine like one day knowing like my brother, my, I, you mean my brother's got to save me? Oh, if anybody knew anything about comparison, it was him. And James was, was so skeptical and so cynical. I mean, wouldn't you be if somebody told you that your little brother is, is the Savior, your big brother's the Savior? Wouldn't you be skeptical? Mm, I don't know. I've been around him for a long time, you know. But look, and, and that's how we know we're, we're looking at truth here. I mean, this, is out of, this is out of his personal experience. Look at verse 14. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Now, hold on a minute. Because if there ever was a Union Church verse, this is it. And go ahead and tell whoever's keeping clock that we ain't hitting it. If there ever was a Union Church verse, this is it. If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, which that's us, don't kid yourself, then don't boast about it and don't deny the truth. That's what we just did when we said here a few minutes ago, I made you raise your hand. We're not denying the truth, it's true, it's there. Let's just, let's just admit what it is, that there's discontentment and there's envy and it is what it is. Look at 15 and 16. Such wisdom, look, he uses, he uses hashtag, I mean, uh, these little pretend, uh, we call them quotations. You know what I mean? Some of you do that all the time because you're a smart, you know what? And so you, you, you know, anybody ever use the hashtags? Like, you know, you come home, I've, I've done this before, this is bad. I told you I already talked about my wife shaving her toes. So anyway, um, I, I come in before and she's like, I cook dinner. And then it's, it's, like, um, it's like frozen pizza or Hot Pockets. And you'd be like, uh, dinner was good. Yeah? Bad trouble when you do that. You know what I mean? It's bad. Hashtag, so he's, he's like, uh, wisdom, <laughs> I don't think so. What's funny is this, he's talking about two different kinds of wisdom in this particular verse. He says, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but look at it. It doesn't come down from heaven. It is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. That's pretty harsh. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. So, so it's demonic envy in our hearts is demonic not many things you're going to hear the bible call demonic it's not just something we can deal with on our own en envy is not some bad thing we shouldn't do it's demonic it's of the devil so when we choose to be envious and contemptful of other people and, and have that discontentment in our heart we are choosing to be worked on, be used by the devil instead of by God. It's demonic. And so, you know, you can't beat demonic by yourself. So the question was, is, is that why do we need Jesus to kill comparison? Why do we need Jesus' to strength to kill comparison? Why do we go all the way back to Philippians 4.13, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me, and know that's about envy and the contentment, and know that we gotta have the, we've got to have the power and strength of Jesus to kill discontentment and envy but it's because it's demonic if you're that person that's just going around all the time looking on facebook and and being envious of every single thing that you posted like our girl on the screen if that's you some of you are doing it right now in church right now you oh I like that i wish i had it your phone's about this big too I don't like it. <laughs> stupid but you you can't beat that on your own it's demonic You've got to have Christ's strength to do it. You can't beat it by yourself. Number two, and i got to roll. Number two. So first we're going to kill comparison, and next we're going to cultivate gratitude. Cultivate gratitude. Cultivate. You know what I mean? Get the tractor out, plow up the soil, put some lime down, lime it, kill all the weeds, plant the stuff, pick the weeds, water it, cultivate constantly. Working on it, working on it, working on it. We're going to cultivate gratitude. And here's the crazy thing about gratitude. It's not just personal. That's what we think when we think gratitude. Like we're grateful to God for what he's done for us. Right? And most of the time we think that's right. 
And a lot of times we've been told that that's the case. That's half of gratitude. That's half. Gratitude is not just something that is personal. It's not just something in our own lives. I want to read you this scripture. This is John 21. I told you we were going there and it just took me a while to get there. This is, this is the scripture that's following our Easter scripture from Sunday. So if you were here for Easter, you know what we preached on. And John 19, 20, and 21 have been kicking my butt for months. And let me tell you what happens and set it up. It's, it's, it's 21 verse 15 when you get there. So after he's appeared to Thomas and Didymus and, you know, T. Diddy, and he puts his hands in the holes in the side and all that stuff happens, right? And then he believes and, and then Jesus is going to appear again. But in the meantime, Peter has decided that he's going back to what he did before Christ. Discontentment. Like things didn't go the way he thought it would, so I'm going back to fishing. Right? And that's some of you right now. That's some of you in your life right now. Like you, 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 you found Christ, he started working in your life, and then you started to see, and then, the, then you were like, this ain't as easy as I thought it would be. This ain't going, I'm going back to what I did before. That's what Peter does. But you know what Jesus does, though? He comes and gets him again, which I think is awesome. So they're out there fishing. The other disciples follow, and they're like, well, we'll go too. You know, let's go back to our life too. And they're out there, and then Jesus comes and tells them to cast their nets on the other side of the boat because they ain't catching no fish and because they, they're doing the wrong thing, right? And he gets them to throw it over. They catch a bunch of fish. They come in. They eat. And then look what happens in verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? This is a very personal verse to me. Because Peter denied Jesus three times in Scripture, written down. I'm sure it was much more than three, but it's three times written down in Scripture. That he denies Christ, and Christ redeems every single denial. He redeems every single denial. And I find solace in this verse. Because every time I've denied God or been ungrateful or lacked content in what he's done or looked at some other church that I told you about before, every time I've done it, if I go back to Jesus and tell him I love him, he redeems the denial. It's just who he is. Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. It's interesting, isn't it? He's giving him work, giving him a job. He's saying, here, you be the shepherd. Take care of my people. They're my babies. They're my kids. Take care of them. Show them who I am. Feed them. Give them them the word. Teach them. Lead them to me. Jesus has given him such a huge blessing right here to somebody who don't deserve it, who completely denied it, but here's the blessing slapped into his lap. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He asked him again. Why? Because he's got to redeem all those denials. He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. It's a big job, son. I'm going to tell you again. It's a blessing on your life. Take care of them. Love them. Lead them to me. The third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you. Peter's hurt. He's like, you know that I love you. Quit asking me that. And God's like, Jesus is like, here's your blessing. He says, feed my sheep. He tells him again, feed them. What's he going to feed them? The word, God, Christ himself. That's what he's going to feed them. He gives them this big, huge blessing, this big, huge job, right? It's the biggest blessing Peter's ever received outside of accepting Christ is you've accepted Christ and I'm going to put you to work, son. I got faith in you. I got trust in you. I'm blessing you. I'm putting you to work. And then look what he says next. This is Jesus. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. He says, Peter, you gonna, you saw my hand stretched out on that cross. That's how you're going to die. The greatest blessing he could ever gonna give him and then tells him that he's going to die for Christ. Look, I... This is going to sound weird to you, but we couldn't be so lucky and so blessed to take whatever Jesus took for us, for him. And I might change my mind when I'm in the middle of being on that cross, but right now we couldn't couldn't be but so blessed to suffer or walk anything that Jesus has walked. It says, 
Jesus said this to indicate the, king, the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Glorify God. Hmm. So it doesn't, it's not a bad thing. It's a blessing too. And he'll glorify God through it. Then he said to him, follow me. He says to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw, and this is where it's important. This is where we get to it. And we'll wrap this up. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following him. That's John, the one writing the book. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Peter turns around and looks at him back behind him. He's given Peter's, Peter's gotten the biggest blessing he could ever get from God, the charge he could get from Jesus, told what is going to happen to him, that he's going to bless God's name by dying for him. And then Peter turns around and goes, well, what about that guy? Comparison. Envy. Look what Jesus says back. Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Well, if Jesus puts your stuff in there right now, if I want them to have that or be that person or go that place, what's that to you? Follow me. See, gratitude, real gratitude is being thankful and calling a blessing a blessing no matter whose life it's in. A blessing from God is a blessing from God is a blessing from God. No matter who it's for or what it's for or what person it's for, even if it's not for your family, a blessing from God is a blessing from God. And true gratitude is looking at other people and saying, thank you, God, for how you've blessed them. I want you to stand to your feet. We've been doing this all day, and I'm going to charge you to do it again. In just a minute, when I pray, whenever you feel led to it, I want you to walk down here to this altar. You're like, Adam, it's not an altar. Look, an altar's where God is, okay? He right here. And I want you to pray and thank God for the blessings in somebody else's life. And you know who you need to pray for because of the same ones you're envious of and you're discontent with what you have and you want what they got. I want you to walk down here and I want you to pray to God for them, thank God for his blessings in their life because a blessing is a blessing. And real gratitude, the way we really care comparison is we understand that blessings come from God and he is to be praised for them even when they're not in our own lives. And earlier today, two people walked up here and got saved in the middle of all this. That's a blessing. But you know what? I bet you some people got saved and our lives got changed in other churches today, and that is a blessing from God. It doesn't matter where it is or what it looks like. And so I challenge us, if we're really going to kill comparison, if we're really going to crush envy, the only way to do it is to replace it with true godly gratitude. God, I am thankful for what you've done in that person's life. I am thankful for what it looks like in their life. I'm thankful for their marriage. I'm thankful for their kids. I'm thankful for their job. I'm thankful for where they live and the house that they have. I'm thankful for their success. See, we get so caught up in gratitude that it's just about us. Let's be thankful for other people. That's true. That's, if you want to kill, if you want to kill it today, I mean, look, if parish has been killing you, envy's been killing you, it's been killing you, ain't it? Constantly scrolling through and looking and wishing you were somebody else. You know what will kill it real quick? True gratitude. A blessing from God is a blessing from God. I'm going to pray with you, and I want you to come up front as you feel led, whenever you want to. God, we love you. We praise you right now, Lord. Just, just one minute, just a different prayer, God, from me to you right now. From me to you, God. From me to you. I thank you, and I'm grateful for how you have moved and worked everywhere that you move and work. Right now, God, I pray for blessings from you, and I don't care where they fall, just blessings from you. Anywhere, any person, any church. God, my flesh will fail you. It will absolutely fail you. But you never will fail me. That is, your, that is your promise. You will never fail me. Every single time I denied you, God, every time I was envious and discontent with what you gave and being used by the devil in that moment, you have redeemed every denial when I ask you to. Right now, I just pray that you just, Lord, right now, we're going we're gonna to cultivate right now here. We're going to plant the seeds of real gratitude that you are to be praised your blessings are to be thanked. We should thank you for them, God, no matter where they exist or what they come down on. Lord, we know the secret, the secret to being content in every situation is that we can do anything through your strength. It's all that we need. I pray that you'd move in hearts today, God, that we crush envy and discontentment, which is demonic on its head. We would crush it. We need your strength to do that. Lord, we 
will fail you. We are weak. You are so strong. You are so good. You are so worthy to be praised. Lord, right now in this church, anybody who's struggling with praising you, open up their eyes to the blessings that are all around, whether they're theirs or not. God, you are that great. And we sing to you today. We worship you today. We pray at your altar, God. I just pray you would work and move in our lives. God, we need this. We don't need to be defined by a generation who wants more and more and more. We need to be defined as a generation who says thanks God for everything, no matter where it comes down at. God, if you're done with us, if you don't want anything else to happen in this church, Lord, do it and move it somewhere else. We will follow you. We praise you. We love you. We give it all to you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.